Okay, it's um, it's half past six, so um, let's um, let's get this event going. Um, I'm Catherine Croft. I'm the director of Twentieth Century Society, and it's enormous pleasure to introduce Elaine Harwood, who I suspect will need no introduction to, to well, certainly to those of our members who we've got logged on tonight. Because I do know that there are probably lots of you who aren't members who are here. Um, so Elaine is one of the foremost historians of the post-war period. Um, her, she always looks embarrassed when I say that, but it's definitely true. And as exactly. well as writing many books and working for Historic England as an expert on um, 20th century architecture, she has been involved in the 20th century society for even longer than I have, which is saying something, and has organised a huge number of lecture tours, I mean study tours and, and, and lecture series for us. Um, and has um, I mean has done a huge amount for us so we're, we're incredibly grateful Elaine that you're here again to talk to us about um, Art Deco um, and this is um, following on the publication of the Art Deco Britain book which 20th Century Society um, has published with Batsford and which Elaine is the author of so if you haven't already got a copy of that we have got a special offer tonight just for the ebook um, you can get 40% off, as you can see. Um, it's all but titles. You... It's not just Art Deco, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. We have all sorts of 100 buildings, 100 churches, 100 houses, and there's 40% off all of those tonight. So um, I'm not very good at being a saleswoman. But anyway, um, do look that out. And do, um, I mean, it's actually a lovely book to hold as well, so you might want to get hold of a physical copy too. Um, and, um, oh yeah, Elaine is now waving it. Um, we are it gets 20th Century Society, um, we organise lots of events and fun things, but we are primarily here to, um, to preserve buildings. We do a lot of casework, we do um, um, a lot of lobbying to get buildings listed, and then we negotiate with architects and planners and building owners to make sure that buildings um, are uh, sympathetically treated when when they come up for alterations so that's that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and our membership fees go towards funding that uh, and normally our events also contribute to to um, funding our casework as well so we're doing this tonight for free but if you were able to make a donation we'd be really grateful and we do have some sets of gift cards um, to hand out to anyone who um, donates more than £10 um, and we actually got two sets we've got in India which you can see here and we've also got four um, images of Japan so if you if you do donate £10 or more um, let us know which set of cards it is that you'd like us to send to you so I think probably now without more ado I shall hand you over to Elaine's um, more than competent hands to take us through um, a history of art deco architecture in Britain Fantastic. Thanks, Catherine. This is the this is the iffy moment when we hit share screen, we hit PowerPoint, we hit that one. And come along. Ooh. There we go. You see, such organization have but you now see before you all the C20 publications that we've done with Batsford, except the 100 buildings, which has gone missing. And I don't know who to blame for that, um, whether I've just lost it, which is probably the most likely thing, or whether more like it's here somewhere. But there they are. And it would be nice, wouldn't it, if we keep the series going, to have more lectures on some of the other books if this one goes well. We'll, we'll see how we go. I draw your attention to the gardens and the landscape one, which has come out on, during this purder, um, but which is, uh, I would say it's got the best cover uh, and was uh, the most challenging one to do. So, Art Deco, what is it that makes Art Deco so um, inspiring and such a, a, a sort of fun subject if you're for a Thursday night. I think one of its appeals is that there's something for everybody, whether you're, uh, you can afford to stay or um, have tea at Claridge's, or if you are a worker um, at 
the Hoover factory. Actually, if you were just a worker, you'd have gone in the door around the back. This grand entrance was just for the, the office workers. Uh, and there was a boardroom up on the first floor. Um, and I always put this into my talk, not only because it's the only picture of me I like, aged five, but also because I want you not to look at the picture of me, I want you to look at the frame. Um, because I know the provenance, it's my um, grandfather was called up when the war started in 1939, and sent my mum a picture of himself in his uniform and she went to Woolworths and this to buy this frame for the picture which costs sixpence and you can see it's got the little fan shaped motif it's rather odd but it's asymmetrical but I suppose for sixpence and and my granddad then changed the picture to one of me and I inherited it um the origins of Art Deco, is Art Deco begin and the modern movement end, there's a huge overlap. And if you look at somewhere like Fenilla in Cambridge um, on the Queen's Road beyond the backs where uh, Mansfield Forbes acquired a professor of English, acquired a lease of 1840 house which you can see buried underneath this new render of pink and yellow plaster work he got a young student Raymond McGrath from Australia to remodel the interior and it's a birthplace of the modern movement in Britain it's where the 20th century group was founded in 1930 by McGraw with Serge Chemayev, a forerunner of the Mars group, and if you like, I guess, of the 20th century society in a way. Um, but the motifs based on a sort of fountain motif, there was a fountain outside here, Finella was a Scottish goddess um, who came to a nasty end, chucked down a waterfall. Um, and, and shiny surfaces and reflections were sort of theme, along with water, were a theme of the house. And you see it here in this hallway with these metal finishers and bright lacquers. And here in the, um, the main drawing room, the pinks, as it was known. Now you see the study of a music professor, Robin Holloway, but um, with copper pl coated plywood, folding screens, um, all bringing in colour modernity. But for finishers, the colour also, I think what many of us associate with that modern term, Art Deco. We have to remember that Art Deco was not a 30s term. We'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but to sort of continue that thought, High and Over by Amaz Connell, Connell, a New Zealander. Note how many um, non-Brits are involved in the modern movement. Uh, you can see that um, here, working for an archaeologist, Bernard Ashmole, producing this first thoroughly modern house. And there's no doubt that this is the modern movement. It's white painted brick, uh, expressive use of concrete up the top here. Um, and yet the inside, you still have uh, obsession with um, rich materials, bright decoration, a sense of opulence and, and show. So the two go hand in hand and you start to think it's just Art Deco, a slightly derogative term that's sort of used for um, decoration, uh, the work of the architects who were not at the top of the game like McGrath and Connell were at this time. Um, you see in new ways, this is what sort of claims to be the first modern house in Britain by the German Peter Behrens. You have, yes, white rendered 
uh, brick. You've got some very odd decoration here, almost classical, isn't it? The use of those dentils there. And note this square, this staircase um, detail, because it's repeated. It's straight off rip off, isn't it? Thomas Tate and Frederick McManus. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Silver End, the, the little estate village, the workers at the Crittles window factory. These were the um, or houses for, I suppose, some of the higher paid factory workers. But the foreman had this rather grander house at the end of the street. And you see in the balcony uh, and the um, door there, rather these jet motifs that we today associate with Art Deco. At the time, the style was called jazz modern, most frequently the term Art Deco comes from um, a, a revival of the 1925 exhibition of which more in a short moment. Um, when you get on to late and other houses like Edward Morph, Seattle Hill, with this mix of sources, modern and traditional, and the use of this sort of Spanish hacienda style blue tar roofs, because it was built for um, Carter family who were manufacturers of poor pottery. So there's a lot of ceramics around the building and the mix of styles bringing in other motifs apart from strict modernity suggests that we're on to something much broader here. And to make the point, I mean, there's an absolutely no doubt, high point one, you know, admired by no less than Le Corbusier when he visited Britain in 1935. This was this sort of high point literally of the um, international truly modern white concrete style in Britain. It displays Le Corbusier's five points of the, the Pilotti, the strip windows, etc. And Rebeckin, the architect himself, makes the point the door handles at high point are not modern. Look at that E. Well, there's, there's that fluting that you saw on my picture frame. They are modern. Look how simplified. And of course, lesser architects couldn't do that simplification. And you find buildings that are really show the epitomise of so both elements all in one. You have Owen Williams, the architect of the Boots Factory, producing the Daily Express building with the very concrete frame clad in vitrolite, this fantastic shiny black glass cladding, first made in America, but then franchised by Pilkingtons, um, perhaps the material of the 30s and 50s uh, and doing something like a curtain wall. But inside, uh, Robert Atkinson is brought in to produce this rather fantastic foyer, um, the image of empire by Eric Kennington may not appeal, I think, in these um, times it's uh, it shows the diversity celebrates the diversity of empire shall we say but in a very 1930s way with Britain on tops but but Atkinson and the irony of that of course is that Atkinson like Williams have learned their trade and learned their respective styles in the United States Atkinson had, was the president of the Architectural Association uh, and he went over in 1919 to New York to discover cinema architecture and I think that makes him that experience really at the beginning of this commercial style pushes him into the forefront of this commercial jazz modern and you see it very well at his conversion 
adaptation, remodeling, that's the word, of the dome theatre, the old exercise ground for the stables at the Brighton Pavilion, which he uh, had become a concert hall and which uh, in the 1860s and which Atkinson transforms in this deco style in 1934-5. So what are the sources of, of this idiom? And they're very, again, they're very absolutely in parallel with those of the modern movement itself. And they, I would argue, have their origins in Vienna. So if you're looking at something like the secession building in Vienna, Joseph Muir Albrecht, you've got these great bare panels, but then the detail, these very stylized, very geometric flowers, even the lady's hair is rather more symmetrical than perhaps Art Nouveau, there's a bit more Art Nouveau with these sort of dangly bits down here, isn't there? But and this sort of formal geometric pattern, very stylized decoration. This is what Viennese decoration was doing. If you think, if you know your good stuff, Klimt Post and all that stuff. And, and the world of um, Max Fabriani using these very bright colored tiles in a similarly repetitive decoration across this office building for Portois and Fix, again in Vienna. And even the, the, the American bar by Adolf Ruth uh, from 1908, rather dodgy interior coming up. I, I sneaked this one when I was over there a couple of years ago. Um, there's, and the actually, no, I was given permission by, but I had to do it very quickly. Um, a Unity Temple, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, showing how that same decoration goes across both um, Central Europe and Central America. And of course, Luce had fallen out with his mum and left Bruno, his native Bruno, to go and work in Chicago for a time. Um, and but I think you can see the, the, the similarities in Wright's decoration here. And Wright goes on to um, look at um, Mayan architecture of America and this looking at sort of non Western sources comes out in buildings like his Barnstall House in Los Angeles from 1922. You can see the Ballet Russe with its bright colours um, and again geometric patterns and of course the world of Tutankhamun whose uh, tomb was discovered in 1922. The, the uh, Queen Mother, Queen Elizabeth, had um, Egyptian motifs on her going away outfit on her marriage in 1924. So extensive was the enthusiasm for Egyptian art, artistry and decoration. You say, um, if I lean out the window here, I can wave at this building, the, the Carlton Cinema as was. Um, you see it on bingo here, it's now a church. Um, only the exterior has the um, fluted columns with tulip heads, the overgrown cornets, all done in Havenware Faience, very much um, a material of the times. I think what I want to demonstrate is how a whole range of styles could be picked up by modern materials here, a steel frame um, at Daily Express, it was concrete, to show a whole range of idioms from all over the world, but transported into modern guise I suppose taking a sort of Hollywood turn, which is why the style was so suitable for the movies. And this is where the um, 
all these sort of genres um, came together, the haute couture of Paris, seeking to mix itself in with uh, traditional furniture industries, um, goods trades of Paris, all seeking an outlet and a display with the Exposition des Arts Décoratifs et Modernes et Industriels. And there, on, you see, on this old postcard, you can see where that term Art Deco came from. When, in 1966, there was, um, 65, 6, there was a revival, looking back, exhibition, looking back at the world of the Bauhaus Modern Art Deco. The term was picked up in a review by the Times and then by Bevis Hillier, first chairman of what was the 30th Society, became the 20th Century Society. And uh, in his book in 1968, and so the, the term, um, was a reborn in the 1960s, really not less for architecture initially than for objects. Art Nouveau was getting too expensive for all but the most serious collector, and Art Nouveau took Art Deco took its place. And if you look at the details, um, the the Seine is flowing along here, the Paris. Um, the Grand Palais is there, the Pont Alexandre III, uh, and all these pavilions were erected by a different French superstore. Uh, the different countries had their own pavilion, the British pavilion, um, Howard Robertson and Oliver Bernard was fought a little bit industrial and a little bit stayed, of course. A uh, highlight of was perhaps the uh, René Lalique's glass fountain. Lalique starting to move away from producing small, beautiful objects into architectural scale glassworks at this time. Um, Nothing's left of that show. It was a purely um, temporary exhibition. But if you go to the outskirts of Paris, near the Paraphanique, um, the Port Dorite, you'll see the former Musée des Colonies or Musée d'Africa et Océanie. Um, again, that very stylized interpretation of different cultures. But um, a very Western interpretation of Thai, Thai silk picture here. Um, but inside, it's worth going in, and it's for, for the two rooms that survive from the 1931 exhibition, decorated by Parisian. In what they're doing there, I have no idea. They're nothing to do with the colonies whatsoever, unless they're sort of hardwoods and so forth. But um, the furniture, the murals, the ensemble is absolutely perfectly um, surviving. And Leote was the general who brought the whole exhibition together. And something of that French style was very heavy still rather classical style. You know, think of the nudes of Fernand Léger, and they're sort of transported into this building, which is by Wallace Gilbert and Partners, 1932, but designed for Coty Factory, uh, who wanted to have an outlet in Britain for manufacturing um, makeup, and particularly perfume. Remember Coty Lémont perfume? Um, if you're old enough like me, and I had a Saturday job for a bit in a co-op chemist in Long Eaton, and our best seller was Cote Lemont perfume, which I cannot do in anything other than a Long Eaton accent. Um, cash a quick 
can catch it, as you can imagine. That's another story. But those sort of fat, implied order, they're not columns. Look, they're going backwards. But because they've got the three um, tops, stripes of a capital, then you've got... Uh, you've got an order produced and this was uh, and here you have Lalique uh, working in Jersey for Lady Trent the widow of Jesse Boots founder of the Boots company of Nottingham um, where my mum worked never mind um, but, and he, he she was from Jersey and they retired out there and on his death he got she got this little church of 1840 transformed with these glass screens glass uh, screens altarware etc font the lot and it's now known as the glass church um the America did not contribute to the 1925 exhibition. It was, it, the government claimed that it didn't have any modern architecture or design. I think Frank Lloyd Wright might have had something to say on that subject. Certainly by October, those French companies, the, the great stores, were in New York, putting on scaled down versions of all the exhibits. And you see that there was an outpouring of um, sunbursts and stainless steel, such as the Chrysler building, um, all over Central York. Apologies for the old side as they were taken on the society's trip there in 2000, so they're going back to a pre digital age. But if you want to, we can't get to New York at the moment, but you can see a little bit of New York here in London if you're around. Um, don't look at the spaghetti house, look upwards. And um, Raymond Hood, architect. In, a, in New York of many of those tall skyscrapers built the, for the American Radiator Company a black skyscraper in New York and in Britain in um, London produced what was known as the Moor of Argyle Street uh, in the writing by Tristan Edwards I think it's the architect and building news the black you see contrasting with this image of flames up at the top there and in panels of beaten metal round the doors and windows it said it was originally just that bit and gordon jeeves extended it jeeves was the british partner he'd previously worked for luchin so it's quite a big stylistic jump i think but he puts an extension on in 1935 but sort of um, copies beautifully but it rather devalues the impact by making it so much bigger the great contrast of course is with liberties which is behind where i'm standing taking the picture and you can just see a bit of the regent street um portland stone um staidness in the front there and um, but this is the building that brought deco to Tension. It was um, Nicholas Pevsner con considered it, and Hoover as a great affront to modernism. Uh, but it was all Firestone, Wallace Gilbert and Partners. Um, Thomas Wallace was a, a commercial architect who ran a very big firm. I think left his wife for his secretary. Um, so I think lived, breathed, work, and run a huge successful company. Having previously worked for Albert Kahn, who was a pioneer of the Kahn system reinforced concrete, so got a lot of American clients. And a lot of these companies, Hoover, vacuum cleaners, Firestone Tires, India, Vinchinan, 
American tyres again up in Scotland, Wrigley's chewing gum up in Wembley, all American companies that Thomas Wallace, uh, when he set up as his own architectural firm, outbreak of the First World War, he got the American contracts. And this is very much an architecture of 60 miles an hour, you know, the impact you've got. The, the columns, you've got the manicured lawn, you've got the gates, you've got the, you had the Christmas tree at Christmas, you had the clock. Behind, you had great facilities, playing fields for the uh, football pitches, cricket pitches for your staff, uh, a canteen, and so forth. And finally, Firestone was set to be listed in August 1980, and the bank holiday intervened and over the week there was nobody in the office or at the department of the environment to sign off the listing on the friday afternoon they'd all disappeared early for the holiday and over the weekend the bulldozer went smash through the middle and that prompted um Department of the Environment, what became English Heritage's listing team, now Historic England's listing team, to do a survey of Echo buildings and recommend 150 to be listed. Uh, and in 1984, I became the administrator who had to sort of keep a record of uh, any more additions to that list and one of the first ones to be added was the hoover building the back's been demolished it's tesco around the back and this is now flat so hoover factory has now become very limited has now become hoover building but you can see the lawns etc um and the style of the whole thing the canteen survives just next door an oval team not listed survive the frontage survives as a scheme of flats oval team court you have very good view of it from the railway out of euston by james bowden who is a former partner of thomas wallace i should explain that nobody knows who gilbert was whether he was an american sleeping partner or if he really didn't exist and it just made the name sound good. His biographer never found out. And I think perhaps most stylish of all, um, this is very much restored. The uh, um, Carrera cigarettes, manufacturers of black cat cigarettes, so there's a sort of reason for the Egyptology here uh, and using Egyptian um, tobacco for some of their products. Um, Carreras, I think Black Cat used Egyptian, but Craven A uh, was actually the Carreras' number one product, which was the first filter tip cigarettes. So, um, massive factory, controversial because it was built on the public, on the open square of Mornington Crescent doesn't sound right and it's not it was question but it prompted the london squares act of 1931 all um rothmans who took over carreras move out in 1959 down to basildon taking the cats with them and uh the all this was painted white and forgot till restored at the end of the 90s by Marshall and Munchenbach. Uh, different styles again. You can see here Celian Paget at Elton Palace, 1933 to 6, putting their additions on to the surviving great palace of Richard II, um, the best of a real Errol Flynn stuff, you know, medieval drawbridge taking you over a real moat right in the heart of London suburbia. But inside Celian Paget's editions, um, the marquetry by Jack Dirkmaster, a whole range 
of Swedish and Italian decorators, Marion Dawn carpets, the English heritage um, remade the furniture here, and the bathrooms particularly good. When this reopens, I do recommend the bathrooms. Looking and the, the marquetry shows Swedish as well as in, uh, I think it's, this is a sort of based on Stockholm um, to combine with other a comparable piece that's based on Italy and Rome and the sort of romantic romance of the Renaissance. Oliver Belnard, who I mentioned, worked on the British exhibition, British Pavilion, at the 1925 exhibition, produced a couple of, ho remodeled a couple of hotels for Joe Lyons um, of Lyons Corner House fame, the Strand Palace. This is gone. I think it's significant that it wasn't just demolished in 1969, actually all this um, was taken away and stored in the V&A. It's the first recognition, again, 19, the late 1960s, that this um, architectural decoration has a value. And this survives, um, it was listed in about 2000, by yours truly, this was the smoking room of the Regent Palace Hotel. Um, now, it's the cocktail bar of Brasserie Zedel. Um, I hope we can all go back there very soon. And this is the where the 30s Society was founded in September 1979, the forerunner of the 20th Century Society at the Park Lane Hotel. I should explain why Mayfair is so good for Art Deco. Um, the great London townhouses would be with their ballrooms and their, their suites of fine entertainment suites were being demolished through the 20s and 30s. And yet the Debs still had to come out somewhere. They're still needed to be society balls and do's and so Clara just build on an extension it says my internet connection is unstable I'm, and I hope I'm not talking to nowhere um, the and the the Park Lane Hotel was built in 1925 with a basement ballroom and this grand foyer was added in 1927. Murals by Miss Gilbert, I don't know who she is, stunning silver leaf and you go down those stairs and into this grand ballroom that runs underneath the whole hotel. And Claridge's you've already seen. Basil Ionides, it's basically a hotel of the 1840s that was rebuilt in the 1890s as you can see by the red terracotta there. But then uh, it was modernized first by Basil Ionides who did some alterations to the dining rooms inside there and then this new front was put on by Oswald Milne who added the ballroom at off piece to the left there. I love the way they have black traffic cones to match the outfits of the guys on the door. And then uh, the Savoy Hotel um, in the Strand and Savoy Theatre built by um, Richard Doily Cart for the staging of Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, Doily Cart operas. The, this is all the steel and chrome um, chrome starts being added to steel in the 1920s. Chromium used to give the element its proper term. Um, and there's again a lovely glass fountain there. And then inside, Ionides again with Frank Tugwell transforms the old theatre auditorium. Surprisingly big because it goes down. It uses the steep slope from the strand down to the river to squeeze in the, the, the theatre. So you actually enter 
at that balcony level, not into the stalls. But again, silver leaf, much more sophisticated than gold. Um, sophistication, it's tooting. This is, uh, I don't think we're going to be doing open house here this year, unfortunately, but normally I'd be doing tours here in September with the Cinema Theatre Association, my other great enthusiasm. Um, absolutely ordinary on the outside, by Cecil Macy, who was an established theatre architect, did the Wimbledon Theatre. Inside, you go through this uh, hall of mirrors, so you can see yourself reflected into infinity on either side. That takes you through the back of a long site to where land was cheaper, and then into an auditorium with three thousand seats originally. See, ignore the bingo tables have been put in and raised. The um, stage level is here. And behind this little um, rope is the bingo caller's desk. And up on open house days, there rises the Wurlitzer, brought from Sacramento, 1931. Um, it was flooded in 2007, just after it had been restored, and it's currently being restored again. Very sorry. But you can see the sort of idea of being in the Venetian Gothic, Sidney Bernstein, developed Granada cinemas, the name taken from a holiday in Spain, goes on to perform Granada television why the name's familiar. He brings in, as his de interior designer, a Russian prince, Theodore Komisajewski. You can remember that name because it's um, local. At the t time, he was nicknamed Come and Seduce Me. Peggy Ashcroft was the first of three wives. Um, he was really interested in theatre. Um, connected with Stanislavski movement and an impresario and very uh, much at the forefront of new directions and direction directing in theatres uh, and this was a way of decorating cinemas was a pay way of paying the rent but he brings in another Russian Victor Pollyon in these motifs are Russian folk tales but you see the whole thing is sort of rather gothic um, but you can also see this is the steel holding the building up holding the roof up there's another steel here but it's quite solid piece of architecture if you go inside the Astoria, Brixton, now the Academy uh, on live venue. venue. Um, again, classical on the outside, EA Stone, architect, also an investor in the company, along with Paramount Pictures of America. So there's American money coming in here. And Stone adopts an American style, the atmospheric, um, the first gig I saw here was Echo and the Bunnymen with masses of dry ice and it was fantastic. It sort of brought the whole effect to life. Uh, but originally, you would have had a Brenograph spreading clouds over the ceiling and you would sit in the store sort of circle imagining you were in an open court in a... a in a Renaissance palace. Um, if you're, again, I guess if you went to gigs in the 70s, you might remember going to the Astoria in Finsbury Park, the Rainbow, as it was. Same architect, same company, uh, same kind of grandeur of the foyer, which is turn again, there to turn you off to get tunnel you to the back of the site where the land is cheaper where there could be a big auditorium and this has is modeled on uh, a scene from arabian nights so you're sitting not in italy but somewhere in persia you know this is this is real exoticism of the type that 
I suppose, put the little black and white screen down there to shame. And above here, these stars twinkled and flashed with the um, on a circuit. Again, this is now in church use. The Cinema Theatre Association did show a film here. And I think they're looking to show a film again, I hope, sometime at one of these other St. Great Surviving Cinemas. Um, for the book, the uh, I think the most difficult, pi intrepid picture, the most difficult one to get, was this one of the Forum Cinema in Bath, because I was, um, I had to sit through a whole uh, religious service um, before going up to the, the minister and saying, can I take a picture? Uh, and actually he was really helpful, but it, it was quite an experience um, going through one of these sort of big evangelical um, performances, the only word for it, and every seat in this great auditorium was taken. Uh, William Watkins and Stuart Gray later be go on to work in hospitals, so something quite different. But this this use of modern, uh, of modern materials to advance historic styles and reinterpret them in the style of, of uh, Hollywood, I think, is a theme, even though the exterior had to fit in with bath, you know, classical, bath stone, and so forth. Um, a real change comes over, and to finish, I want to sort of try and remind you that there is another side to Deco. Um, I've really talked about, thus far, about what the contemporaries would have called jazz modern. Um, the train up to Enfield, which is painted in bright zigzags, became the jazz trains. Uh, it really was a term used at the time, and I suppose it symbolised the, the new music, the sound of the saxophone, etc. But in America, you had quite that start where the, the star really took hold, it came apart bang with the Wall Street crash of 1929. In Britain it was only just getting going there with the advent of the talkies which really arrived here in 1928 but by the early 30s a rather different, uh, simpler but no less uh, equal, in some ways equally impressive style had come to the fore but has its own value. So let's demonstrate the two, and you can then demonstrate no better place really than the Winter Gardens Blackpool. This is the ultimate of absolutely all different mishmashes of entertainment buildings all in one, begun in 1875 very little left of that. You've got a, a, a facade there, Bayonce facade of 1911 by Magdalene Littlewood, the dome. Look at the scale of this bit, we're going to talk about the Opera House in a moment. Inside, it was done over in 1931, um, really at the end of the Errol Flynn style, I suppose you'd start this baronial hall set out for an Indian wedding and it really sort of sums up um, cultural that sharing and um, diversity in its truest sense that um, even the baronial bit has gone from um, what? Haddon Hall to Hollywood and back again. Uh, then in 1937, the Opera House, which I show on the left of my exterior, burnt down and it was rebuilt by the in-house architect Charles McKeith. But look at the difference in style. There aren't any specific re historicist references. You can't say it's modern movement, but it's certainly got movement. 
it feels like the whole thing's been sort of um, poured out of one of a sort of ice cream van. They think that sort of Mr. Softy ripples round this proscenium and along this balcony at 3,000 seats. I think it's the second biggest opera house in the country. Really deserves to be much better known. And the source of this modern stuff, like Lubeckin wrote on his door handle, modern with an E, is less the United States or the 1925 Paris exhibition, its sources are Germany and um, the Netherlands, Northern Europe. I think a very good example is the Chili House in Hamburg, so offices and warehouses for an uh, importing company, the shape determined by a dock formerly along here, Fritz Horscher, the real ar leading architect of this style, using lots of bricks, tiny bricks, used, but putting in curves, movement, action into something, but starting moving away from historicism into something that's um, it's known as expressionism. There isn't really a better word for it. You see the balance of horizontals and verticals extremely well in this great cinema. The facade survives Schoffre, Schoenbeck and Jacobi, 1927-8, which is the source for um, a lot of cinemas that follow in Britain in the mid 30s. Cinema, the 3,000 seat to cinema disappears in favour of more, more numerous but slightly smaller cinemas in more suburban locations or by the seaside at Margate and um, picked up. Um, here you see the contrast of verticals and horizontals picked up incredibly well by E. Walmsley Lewis, very young architect who just graduated from the Architectural Association and he'd done a thesis on cinemas and studied in Germany and in New York before getting this commission to produce this um, the new Victoria which again 1929 one of the first talkies but really the first chain of cinemas, provincial cinematograph theatres became part of Gaumont, which became part of Odeon, but a part of a nationwide chain. So you found new Victorias in Bradford, Edinburgh, um, not just in Victoria, nowhere so well focused as this. Uh, and um, Philip Morton Shand, one of the great critics, so uh, publishes a book called Modern Theatres and Cinemas, which is basically out to condemn everything in Britain as being not modern. And then at, just as he's going to publication, this is built and it goes straight onto the fly sheet. It becomes the um, frontispiece, so halt the press, this is new architecture. And you go in, you go down the stairs, Again, most of the space is underground. Um, the decoration is uh, based on the, the sea. When Wamsley Lewis discovered that the director of P the PCT liked uh, boats and fishing. So you can't see in my side a figure of Neptune in here. Um, this is when it was all tricked out for Starlight Express. It's it's now a, a theatre, but you can see these sort of sea creatures here and shells, and they were originally hanging the strewns, looking like seaweed, all around the space. Um, uh, it's been partially restored, but there's a lot more work to be done. Um, but it's really Oscar Deutsch. Oscar Deutsch entertains our nation, Odeon, that gives the um, style of the Titania class its real exposition in this country. Externally, 
A very good example is Scarborough. Internally, it's been totally gutted and remodelled with listed building consent as a theatre in the realm, Stephen Joseph Theatre. I love, again, here's this glass fountain like object, a pillar, so that you can see where the cinema is from the high street way down to my right. But the vertical fin, which said Odeon on the top, uh, now of course it says theatre, contrasted with strong horizontals, go faster idiom, and the contrast with the, the um, bylaw housing of Scarborough is great. Odeon and Muswell Hill couldn't have a tower because the Congregational Church across the road objected. So inside, George Coles, architect of the Egyptian Carlton, opposite me, um, go, London's greatest cinema architect, goes on to produce this great interior. So gone are all the motifs of um, Spanish Romantic Renaissance courtyards or Arabian palaces. Here you have something looking like being in a cinema. Here's the film trickling down the ley light onto the screen. Um, and very simple motifs. I always feel like you're in a giant cash register that's taken your money, or perhaps you're inside the great canister on which the film, you know, the great camera that would have made the film. It's all very symbolic. These clocks originally said Odeon time, now they say every man. Um, Hilversum Town Hall. Willem Dudok was the architect of the new town of um, Hilversum. I think one of the first borough architects to really come to prominence. Very inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright, as you can see. Interestingly, he's given the um, gold medal of the RIBA, the RIBA's highest honour, ahead of Frank Lloyd Wright. He's much better known in Britain in the 30s than Wright himself. Wright only gets the award in 1939. Um, Dudok gets it in 35. And this town hall inspires Hornsey. Again, the balance, the verticals and horizontals, a modern style, but where public sculpture, a flagpole, civic dignity, it's really not out of place. Um, being converted to flats and all in scaffolding at the moment, I'm afraid. This school, again, Dudok, I mean, Dudok built everything in Hill for some. And these schools with the staircase tower had great influence on the work of, for example, Middlesex County Council. Here's, I think, their finest school, a primary up in. Um, Rice Lady Banks School, the uh, staircase tower done in two tones of brickwork contrasted with concrete. When Curtis and Burchett, the county architects, realised they can no longer afford to build classical schools because Middlesex metro land is growing so fast they can't keep up with the number of new schools that are needed. As you know, Kenton Library, um, health centres all follow this idiom. Um, here in Breslau as was, Roxloff as it is now, Eric Mendelssohn designed the Petersdorf store, um, designed to go, fat, again, expressive bands of concrete, and glass, there's a stone cladding, but it's um, millimetres thick. Uh, and having an influence on water stones. I put this in because um, I, I'm not persuaded this is Art Deco. Batsford were very keen that it should be included. And if you have the book or if you get it on one, the, the deal, um, you'll note that the snowman 
has been photoshopped from my picture. But going back to that idea again of um, where does the boundary of deco and modern here or modern movement is it simply for Emberton's really a very good architect and the detailing here is really sublime yet it's not so very different from what we very happily call modern by lesser architects and uh, Mendelssohn himself comes to Britain in 1933, forms a partnership with Sir Shemayev, um, British but of Chechnyan Russian origin, and together they win a competition for the Delaware Pavilion to bring entertainment, boost the seaside town of Bexhill on Sea. And there's certainly lots of movement in this fantastic um, staircase tower here. Uh, let's see, dates opening plaque there of steel and concrete really coming together. Um, but you can see meant the influence of, of um, Mendelssohn's British masterpiece in Lido's seaside buildings all around the country, just down the coast, Salt Dean Lido, um, R.W.G. Cooper in 1936. Here's an old picture, apologies to the gentleman standing there again, I think of 20th Century Society member. Um, it's gone through many vicissitudes and here you see the pool being restored, not Cooper Jones, I beg his pardon, Cooper's a cinema architect, um, here being restored, I go and photograph it for the book, I pedal up that hill and it's all in scaffolding. Was I cross? So this image is not in the book, had to buy one in. Same thing happened when I got uh, all the way from Pains, Paisley to India of Inchinan, um, outside Glasgow Airport. So all the most distant and hilly ones that were frustrating. Uh, no problems with Blackpool. Here's the Pleasure Beach showing that seaside architecture. I think Emberton here is firmly in the, in the modern style. It's a series of restaurants and bars at the entrance to the Pleasure Beach. And Emberton also did a, designed a number of show frontages to the ride, like the wonderful Grand National. Um, this great block of flats, Dalglesian Pullen, modelled on the Queen, de deliberately took the um, Queen Mary as a model for a, a great showpiece, trying to regenerate the um, suburban seaside town of St Leonard's, really a, a residential resort rather than one for tourists. Um, a block of flats that's coming back to life at the moment. And um, at the seaside in Scotland, some of the best 30s architecture is in Scotland. I think perhaps it's the quality of the um, craftsmanship that um, perhaps it's always been associated with the, um, the shipyards that were building the Queen Mary and so forth at the time and you see something of the same quality of materials in buildings on the northeast but there were a few really great survivals around Glasgow and Nardini's the ice cream parlour um, you go down the water by boat from Glasgow to Largs on the end mouth of the Clyde and there the, the most prominent building is the ice cream parlour um, quite restored but well done I think uh, and a good mix of sort of Lloyd, like your Lloyd room furniture inside I recommend this one. Randall's uh, here it is before it was uh, well closed 
um, again, partly a bit converted, being converted into flats when I was writing the book. So this is where the, the furnishings of Metroland came from. Um, widely published, but I, I know nothing about William L. Eaves. But again, the vertical tower, marking an emphasis, this is very off the main high street, so slightly bigger than normal shop. And um, flats, m large numbers of them, particularly around L London, uh, particularly catering for the emigres who flocked to London from 33 onwards from Germany and Central Europe, including, of course, Ernst Freud, the architect himself, son of Sigmund, father of Clement and Lucian, and a notable architect in his own right. And this banding of windows really starts seeing, when, which becomes a very distinctive 50s motif. You start seeing for the first time in Freud's work and the work of emigres like him. So reinforcing that the importance of Germany, North European architecture into the modern style in Britain. Now I was really, Catherine was talking about the importance of casework which I don't get involved in the society's casework, it would be double conflict of interest as a Historic England employee. Um, you know, which is why you see me doing lectures and publications, um, but not in a more formal role with the society. So I was really surprised how many Art Deco buildings are under threat. Would you believe this garage in Newcastle uh, on time is still fully functioning, packed with cars. It's a, car, a multi story car park of 1931, but just behind the Paramount Cinema, which is, um, was listed, delisted, and now demolished. Um, but this is still going and you can see inside where the valet service would be, um, where there were facilities for the chauffeurs. Uh, in some ways it survives rather better than the list of Daimler garage and um, Bruton Street garage in, in central London. Um, the Royal York Hotel, we had an office trip to the Isle of Wight in, in 2003 and stayed here. It was not five star ride Isle of Wight, sorry it should say on the caption, um, but it was still there. Here's the staircase uh, behind that entrance dome round, with details uh, of bathing beauties I suppose of a sort closed in 2009 approximately, been closed ever since. And when I visited it for the book at the beginning of 2018, restoration seemed very much on hold. Not even Batsford could Photoshop a skip. Uh, the Beresford Hotel in Glasgow, another of these great um, beautiful Glasgow buildings. This was built as a hotel to coincide with the Glasgow Empire exhibition of 1938, very little of which survives the way of exhibition buildings. The hotel uh, became a hall of residence in 1964. The 20th Century Society stayed there on one of Gavin Stamp's trips to Glasgow. Uh, again, not five star, very typical Gavin trip, um, now converted into flats. I think Catherine may tell you about a feature we're doing on exotic places where members might have stayed. Um, and to conclude, the impact that the other thing about Art Deco is it's taking all these styles and idioms and motifs from around the world. It also, perhaps thanks to the movies, thanks because it's such a simple style to do in the contemporary materials of the time, 
but you see it's all round the world. Miami Beach celebrates itself as Art Deco. No, it's modern. Look at the Breakwater Hotel uh, and my mouth trembles at trying to say Anton Skitsovich, but something like that. And the vertical, the horizontal, or even uh, the Tudor, not much Tudor about that exterior, uh, on Collins Street of 1939. Again, it's that simple ice cream architecture with the vertical advertising thing, the long expressive balconies. And in Napier was destroyed by a tsunami. Uh, Napier, North Island, New South, uh, New Zealand, 1932, rebuilt entirely in the modern style. This is as decorative as the exteriors get, the Masonic Hotel. But you see, it, Napier uh, sort of celebrates its Art Deco modern, the clothes shop, the Charleston chic, uh, vintage stalls. Every January, it has a great Art Deco festival. Um, so like Miami, unlike Britain, it's celebrating what it's got. And here's uh, Bombay, Mumbai, um, from an old photograph, not from the Society's recent visit. This is how it looked in 2004 when I went with the Cinema Theatre Association. Some buildings have since been repaired, other buildings have declined or, or been uh, drastically altered. I think there's perhaps more detail there in 2004, but this uh, um, ha was a, a lot rougher. Um, but a whole area of Mumbai that was reclaimed and developed with luxury flats, cinemas, shopping parades. And Yangon, Rangoon, um, part of the empire and part of India uh, until the 20s, part of the empire until 1947, developed with a range of buildings, some classical to deco to modern through the 1930s. And I leave you with the point at which I came in. It was written, this is uh, Terry Fowle's own house from the 1970s, um, image cribbed from our own 1970s journal, but it's showing Fowle rejecting modernism going back to historicist styles, bringing in Egyptiana for his the living room he added to his 1920s um, North London semi. And then um, it was writing the postmodern book with my colleague Darren Franklin for Batsford that made me think, well, if Batsford have asked us to do a postmodern book, Perhaps they'd like, wouldn't it make sense to do the prequel? So there you have Art Deco, and hopefully, <coughs> apologies for the coffee, my voice is gone. Um, I'm currently working on a mid century modern book for the Society. So, a bit like the Star Wars trilogy, you'll get all the books, but not necessarily in the right order. Thank you very much. I'm so thrilled so many of you could join me tonight. Um, really glad uh, you come. Let's see if I can take any questions. And I've overrun, what a surprise. There was one question, Elaine, about how, where you would say that um, London Underground stations fitted into the story. I don't oh, know good whether... question. Um, they, are in, they are in here, right at the back. Um, they're, they're, Charles Holden and Frank Pick went on a study trip of, to Amsterdam and Berlin and Stockholm, so they do fit that modern style, taking, and they're, they're 
sufficiently stripped down and simplified to be modern and yet I think you could also say they are modern because they have that um North European influence I'm trying not to look at myself here it's a hideous <laughs> yes great yeah no I think that's a really good um, good answer and I think we should wrap up there Elaine because you clearly need to go and get yourself a good drink um but thank you oh. um and um, and as Elaine said we are about to launch on the website um a um a page where we will be sharing places that you can rent both hotels and like holiday cottages that we've people have, members have stayed in um that are fantastic, are fantastic. the chat line's going mad i'll have a little look at it everyone okay well I'm not... such nice thoughts thank you everyone yes. i can't see you but big waves <laughs> many thanks good night and thank you very much good night everybody and thanks very much to elaine <laughs>